There we go. All right, recording. All right, so um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that um, everyone today is tuning in um, on traditional lands of First Nations people. I am in Kwakadola, Anglesey, and I would like to acknowledge the Wadarung people as the traditional owners of the land here and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to pay my respect to any other Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and First Nations people joining us today. Um, I'd like to say Nyatni, thank you to the Wadarung people um, and other traditional owners for their continued care for jar, country, Wari, ocean, and other people, plants, and animals. Uh, thanks for joining us, everyone, tonight for this webinar uh, put on by Surf Coast Shire Council as part of the Reimagined Surf Coast event and workshop series. Um, I'm Sam Sunderman, Climate Emergency Officer at Surf Coast Shire Council, um, and I'll be hosting tonight as well as Sean, um, who's joined us, um, my colleague, and he's helping out too. Um, and it's also really good to see Councillor um, Rose Hodge in the audience as well. So thanks for joining us. Um, so just some housekeeping quickly. Um, most of you are on mute. I think that's kind of what happens when you first turn up to the webinar. Um, just make sure that you stay on mute so there's no noise disturbance. Um, we have three incredible speakers, Alex Marshall, Matt Armstrong and Lisa Jarvis, who will be talking about their experiences uh, mobilizing community climate action. Each person will be talking for about 15 minutes and then there'll be question time. So uh, we definitely encourage questions. Feel free to use the chat function um, and just make sure that you, well, you can either choose all panelists and attendees if you want everyone to look at the questions, um, but you can also just send them to the panelists. Um, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Um, and if you can also just wait until the presenters finished um, and ask a question too. So whichever you um, feel comfortable doing. So the focus of tonight is on community led climate action. We're very fortunate in the Surf Coast Shire to have a driven and active community who are passionate about protecting and enhancing our environment. And I'd like to recognize the effort of all people and groups um, who work really hard in this space. And that while we may have different interests, strengths and ideas, it all um, contributes towards a better environment and future. So in response to the climate emergency declaration, um, council is working with the community to discuss different ideas, actions and strategies which could form the community climate emergency response. Um, as part of that, we're in the final stages of developing a profile, uh, which kind of looks at the different sources of greenhouse gas emissions in the community. Uh, so for example, being able to see emissions generated by electricity, transport, gas, agriculture, and waste. And um, we can break that down further by postcode. So that's something that It'll be really useful to see where our mission sources are coming in the surf coast. Um, and that's something that we'll definitely be sharing with once that's complete. Um, we also have a survey on climate change, which is out right now, and that's open until January 10th. So I'm going to um, put the link in the chat. Um, so if you haven't done so already, please complete it when you get the chance. Um, and yeah, it's just important, I guess, to have these two data sources as an evidence base so that when the community begins uh, discussion and planning about what action to take on climate change, it can be informed as possible. Um, and I guess being informed is important um, and being inspired is also just as important. And that's, I guess, why we've put on tonight so that we can listen learn from and be inspired by the work of Alex, Matt and Lisa. So I'd like to introduce Alex Marshall, who is our first speaker. Alex is one of the lead petitioners of the Climate Emergency Declaration. Um, she's involved in Cleaner Coast, which is a local not-for-profit dedicated to cleaning our coasts, while also raising awareness around waste. Um, Alex was also an integral member of the Fight for the Bike campaign, and organizing a lot of local actions in the surf coast and um, wider. 
more recently, which um, I think as of yesterday, Alex was also announced as the winner of the Surf Coast Shire Youth Environment Award, which is really awesome. Um, so congrats on that, Alex, um, and take it away. Thanks so much, Sam. My name is Alex Sheher, and I'm coming from Wadawurrung country. I'm an activist, I'm a student, I'm a disability support worker, and I'm a member of the Surf Coast Shire community. Today, I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about the history of climate emergency declaration, why declaration is important, or why people are so passionate and supportive of declaration, and my experience with uh, petitioning and uh, petitioning to council for to declare climate emergency. Okay, so it started in 2016, when Darabin Council in Melbourne was the first council in the world to make a climate emergency declaration. And now about four years later, there are over 1800 jurisdictions across 30 countries who have declared, which is fantastic. And just in the last few days, the United Nations has called upon all leaders worldwide to declare a state of climate emergency in their countries until carbon neutrality is reached. So why is this important and why are people passionate about climate emergency declaration. It's seen that some people can see it as just tokenistic or virtue signaling and as if it doesn't really do much. It's important to declare because the, the, the climate, climate change and the climate crisis, the climate emergency is serious. It is, it is an emergency and we need to begin calling it that. Given that climate impacts are already causing serious loss of life and destroying vital ecosystems, global average temperature, atmospheric greenhouse gases and ocean acidity are already at dangerous levels. So it is a really serious thing and we need to start treating it like that. And while all that's very negative, the declaration actually offers hope because it promises action. We've risen to big challenges in the past when an emergency has been declared where citizens and all sides of politics have risen to the occasion and work together for the common good. We have all the resources and ability to overcome the climate emergency. We are only lacking two things, political will and the number of people to change that political will. And that's where declaration is so important because that's when politics and people start begin to take the climate emergency seriously and action come, follows a declaration. Um, so why, why at council level, why is that important? It's important because we need all levels of all types of communities, local, state, federal and global to address a global problem. And it's declaration and climate emergency declaration doesn't come from the top, it starts from the ground, from councils, from local communities, choosing to declare climate emergency and, and act as if it's an emergency. Uh, it's because we, again, because we have all the resources and abilities to do this, it's inexcusable to continue with climate damaging policies. And again, it's really a super positive and exciting thing because it encourages further community action like we'll hear from Matt and Lisa. And it's, it, I really, I hope people know that it is truly a hopeful and positive thing to do. My experience with petitioning for the declaration, we, it was a, a whole group of like-minded people in our community and we petitioned for the council to publicly acknowledge the climate emergency, review the council's strategic plan, create a foundation for climate emergency action and implement a climate emergency plan, which is the stage that they're at right now. And it's really exciting because this action can be in the form of addressing local communities, like stationary energy, agriculture, consumption, council waste can be involved in town planning you can look at bigger picture issues for councils in declaring a climate emergency responding to future and current climate risk and engaging community like we are right now and also engaging other councils and this this stuff already does happen and declaration furthers this and in, increases its uh it, it just it, it pushes for more of this and more climate emergency focused action, which is fantastic. We, we need all 
at levels of government to make this a priority. And oh, apologies. now I'm going to talk about the experience with the campaign. So in 2018, all these great people in our community got together, we campaigned, we spoke at events, we spoke to the council, we educated and spread the, spread the word uh, in social media and in person. And so many communities, community members were really excited about this concept and really passionate to, to have it implemented. Graeme Stockton from Skeg, Surf Coast Energy Group, uh, started a petition, an online petition. We were doing physical petitions as well. And that's what we presented to council before they decided to declare climate emergency. And yeah, so that's, that's the, that's climate emergency declaration. That's my history with it. Sam mentioned uh, if I wanted to give any advice for environment or for, for actions that individuals can take and what, what I think people should do. There's a couple of there's a couple of little slogans that I have in my I do in, run environmental workshops for school students. And one of the things is reduce and swap. So reduce your consumption and then the things we do need to consume, swap them where you can for more sustainable options. And the other, which is super important, is learn and listen and love, which I, I think it's super important to do all of those three things. We want to learn more about uh, what we can do, what other people can do, what we can get involved in. We need to listen to different pe ideas and different people and we need to be compassionate and positive and loving in our approach to this. So that's, that's my advice. That's my history. That's a bit about climate emergency declaration and I will take questions now, which is great. I think there's been a couple in the chat. Let's have a look. Oh, should I pass it over to Sam to? Yeah, to... I'm, I'm happy to um, yeah. Yeah, facilitate the questions. So thank we've got, um, yeah, thanks for that, Alex. Uh, yeah. Really great to hear your insight there. So mm -hmm. we've got one question from Katie Rao, um, who I think is actually more for me than you, Alex. But um, the question is, what are some of the main things Surf Coast Shire Council are going to do in their climate emergency plan? Would you like to answer that? You can I'll take that. that. Um, yeah. yeah, and Sean, feel free to jump in as well if you want. Um, so uh, we've actually got currently got our climate emergency short term um, corporate plan, which is being implemented. Um, so we've got some. We've got about forty actions in that action plan. Um, one of the I guess key actions which we're really proud that came out of that, Katie, is um, the development of the Surf Coast um, Youth for Climate group and the, um, I guess, the skill and capacity building program that you were a part of, Katie. So it's good that you asked that question. Um, so that was, yeah, I guess one thing in the, in the plan. Um, Sean, you're the solar guru, but there's also been a lot of solar installation that was included in that plan? Yeah, yeah, we've, we've nearly passed 500 kilowatts of solar going on council buildings. We're looking at options to purchase 100% renewable energy for the council's electricity for its street light network and facilities. We've, um, yeah, we're, we're in the, pro over the last six months or so, we've been meeting with, um, internally with a number of the different teams from across the council. And we're, we've got a draft plan that's very close to being done, which we'll be taking to the, new councillors um, and, and our executive team to get uh, yeah to get support for what we want to do as a corporate organisation. But another part of that, our climate emergency response will be what, um, yeah, helping the community come up with, with what they want to see as the community response to the climate emergency declaration. So I don't know, Alex, if that's maybe a good question for you, a better way, to, a good way to, um, to re throw that question back at you, Alex, but maybe um, what would you like to see in a community, in the community response? Is there anything in particular that, um, that you can think about that you might want to see in yeah, the community response, if that's a community plan or whatever form that takes? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, there's, just, there's so much. There's, I've, I've, my main thing is I, I want every sort of aspect of, of you know, any, any government's functioning to consider 
the the impact this the environmental impact the impact on climate and the climate emergency i think that's the that's my main main passion with climate emergency declaration is to make sure that it's it's council wide it's not just concerning the environment officers environment and sustainability officers um, it it should be an aspect and a consideration and a priority to be honest for across all areas yeah, great. And we're at the, one other thing, we're developing a community emissions profile to get an under. So we have a corporate emissions profile looking at where the council's emissions come from as an organisation. We're also look um, at the, in the nearly finished with a community emissions profile. It gives us an understanding of um, yeah where, where the emissions in the broader community are. And obviously the council's only one small part of that, like 1% mm -hmm. or something. And um, Alex, you raised some really great um, points around you know, the stationary energy use like the, and our electricity use in our transport there's, there's so much we need to do to bring down emissions across the the um the shire so yeah really looking forward to getting into some of those discussions in the first half of next year early next year it's exciting um, yeah, yeah we've just got a few more questions um i think matt wants you to come and join him in apollo <laughs> bay so there's an offer there for you it's pretty nice up there, up there. <laughs> yep I can come up on that for sure. Um, and a question from Belinda. Um, so did you request any specific changes or solutions with the climate emergency response from Surf Coast Council? Um, yeah, so I did the, the ones we read out were in the petition, the ones to publicly acknowledge the emergency, to review the strategic plan create a foundation for cl climate emergency action and implement a climate emergency plan. There were our specific points that we requested. Um, and also there's, we did provide resources or links to different places like um, Community Action and the Climate Emergency online. They have some fantastic resources about specific, ac specific actions that councils and local communities can take so there wasn't anything specific that we asked for except those four points. Cool, thanks, Alex. Um, and the last question, which I can help you out on if you need help, because I was actually researching it last week. Uh, how many councils around Australia have declared a climate emergency? Um, it is, it's, I think it's nearly 100, maybe 97 or something like that. Yep. Yeah, had had the same number. Yeah, same yeah. number. Cool, ninety-seven. It is then. Yeah. And I think that when Surf Coast declared, there might have only been about forty or so. So it's it's mm -hmm. um interesting to have seen that movement grow since. And now we've got like countries like um, New Zealand, and, like we've got the EU declaring an emergency in the UK and stuff. So it's really interesting how it's progressed. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks, Alex. So I might introduce our second speaker. Um, Matt Armstrong. So Matt is a sailor, surfer, parent and poet who in 1991 divorced the city, uh, married the ocean, I wouldn't mind doing that too, and began an affair with trees. Um, he currently heads Southern Otways Sustainable on their 100% renewable energy quest for Apollo Bay and surrounding communities. Uh, awakened to the climate crisis in 1987, he has since alternated between climate warrior and despondent wretch. What an intro, Matt. Um, so uh, over to you. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, Alex. So inspiring to hear that. I live in a shire where we have, um, we have not declared a climate emergency. And uh, despite a petition that garnered something like three and a half thousand um, signatories, largest ever. Anyway, hopefully it's changed with the latest um, council elections. So we live in hope, but um, congratulations to the Surf Coast Shire as well on that. Well, I'm going to share my screen because that's the notes I'm speaking to. Uh, so just bear with me while I... Think that's it there. Does that come up for everybody? Okay, great. So I've been asked to just share our story and our story is uh, sort of not way sustainable. We're an apolitical <clears throat> community group. 
with a vision of a community powered by 100% renewable energy. Uh, we started off with about six members and uh, we've grown since then. A little bit about Apollo Bay, we're isolated and quite vulnerable to fire. Um, we have a long history of un an unreliable power supply and we have a population of about 2,000 in winter and 15 to 20,000 in summer. Uh, this is a mud map of our uh, supply lines coming into Apollo Bay. They both come from Colac and they both go through steep forested terrain. And after the big fires that were, um, I can't remember what they called, it might have been the Black Saturday ones, a, um, a, a ref cow switch was installed. So we constantly get uh, outages and sometimes they go for two hours and sometimes they go for 20 minutes, you never know, sometimes longer. Um, and so places like the bakery have had to install $60,000 generators, et cetera, to, so the community is quite aware of energy and they've had a long relationship with its, uh, their supply. We're, our three roads into town also come through steep forested terrain. So we really are quite vulnerable. We formed in 2018. We um, were just six friends that started it and then we were joined by um, about 20 more people after the Transition Towns Movement um, meeting in town. And that led to fairly challenging times just as we sorted out a new group. And my advice there would be if you can work with an existing group like Surf Coast Energy Group, even form a subcommittee of that or whatever, uh, if you've already got a cohesive group, start with that. But from that start, we came out with a two-phase strategy. One was simply to expand our rooftop solar. It stood at about 8% of capacity at that stage. And our, our intention was to run a community solar program or a bulk buy program as they're sometimes known. And the second phase was to explore beyond rooftop solar options like a mid-scale facility, like a solar farm or a wind farm or whatever and to do that via a roadmap which would explain the best options. Um, from there, we launched into the Community Solar Program and a lot of people contributed to our Community Solar Program. There is so much help out there for communities. And I can't mention them all uh, because I haven't got time, but the main partner that we used was Mondo Power. They are a subsidiary of Osnet Services, which is the equivalent of PowerCore in the east of Victoria. And so each installation that um, we managed, and there are about 50 new solar installations in town as a result of this program, had an UBI, which is a bit of hardware, which we hope will allow us to set up a microgrid before too long. Uh, we went for a local installer, or Mondo chose them from Geelong, and BZE, Beyond Zero Emissions, which are a Melbourne-based think tank, um, staffed mainly by volunteers, were a big help too. The Kola Kotwa Shire gave us endorsement, and that was about it. And Renew and Sustainability Victoria were a big help at the, at the initial outset. This is the cumulative installation of solar in our postcode, which is 3233. This is available on the APVI website. You can punch in your own postcode and get your own data for your postcode, or you can do it for your local government shire, local government area. This red line here indicates roughly when we formed as a group. And while we can't take any credit for the expansion in green, uh, which is green is basically commercial installations above 10 kilowatts in size. And the various shades of blue are basically residential installations below 10 kilowatts in size. Um, and indeed, we can't take credit for all of this expansion either, in that a lot of that is due to the state government coming out with some really attractive tariffs um, around about that time. But there's been a, a really big increase. And so we're very pleased to take some credit and have made some contribution to that. While I'm on this graph, um, I just want to point out I was involved in a climate action group back in the year 2000 and we laboured away and we worked hard and did a lot of good work. But you can see, this is from 2007, this graph. You can see the effects 
of solar installations at least were almost zero. And what that illustrates is that there's never been a better time to install solar. It has never been more affordable. Uh, there are so many good quality brands out there now. There's a wealth of local suppliers um, and it's off the shelf technology that is widely accepted. So things are much easier for community groups now. It's a good reason to really launch something like this, I think. Uh, there's an example for Torquay. Um, this is on a different scale. You're up around 10 megawatts. Uh, we're down around two megawatts for our for Apollo Bay, for the Apollo Bay postcode. Um, this is all available on that same website. There's a wealth of information there. This is looking at uh, lawn. So while the whole of the Surf Coast Shire has a penetration of about 20% solar, that is 20% of solar capacity, total solar capacity has already been installed. Uh, you get places like Lawn, which are only at 6%. Or you go to, oops, you go to places like Dean's Marsh, where it's 25%. And it just emphasises the importance of individual communities. There is no one recipe that fits all communities. Every community has its own uh, particular circumstances that require different solutions. And it's a really important reason why communities are involved in coming up with the solutions. Um, the second phase of our uh, strategy was to develop the Beyond Rooftop Solar options and we were going to do that through a renewable energy roadmap um, which just checking my notes here uh, oh, that's right what I want to mention this lady here is Lisa our treasurer now she runs a, a, a sort of sister group if you like called ocean which stands for the Otway climate emergency action network they're quite political they'd be more what you'd call an activist strong activist group and it allows us, even though both groups have many of the same members, it allows us as an organisation to remain apolitical. And I think that's really important when you're dealing with a wide range of businesses and government bodies, et cetera, and applying for funds. So many of the photos you'll see are taken from some of the actions Lisa's organised or Ocean has organised. So when it came to the roadmap, we got a $10,000 grant from Colac Otway Shire, and we had basically no idea, even though we wrote an excellent application, we had no idea which way to go with that. Um, $10,000 was the maximum they could give us under that scheme. So we approached Beyond Zero Emissions, who immediately contributed $5,000 in kind by the way of three volunteers, uh, two um, experienced uh, electrical engineers, and one um, graphic designer. And we met with them and scoped out what was possible with the cash we had. And uh, what was clear was that we didn't have enough money to do a feasibility study for something like a wind turbine. We didn't have enough money for even a pre-feasibility study. But what we did have was enough money to engage the community and investigate what they felt about our aspirations. Because as was pointed out to us at that, state, at that stage was we had a really robust community group, but what we didn't have was a community movement. And that's really important to have that. So we spent the $10,000 on our professional facilitator and the $5,000 in kind was for the three volunteers that I mentioned earlier. And um, unfortunately, the COVID hit just before we began our engagement exercise, so we had to move to Zoom workshops. And that uh, limited the amount of time that people will devote. And it also limited the amount of people you can connect with. So what we chose uh, 20 people that were heavily embedded in community, uh, community leaders, you might call them. And workshop one explored their interest in our vision of a 100% renewable energy um, aspiration. And then workshop two shared the research that the volunteers had found at BZE on different options. And thirdly, we uh, did a survey to the broader community and got 
about 200 respondents, which we figured was about 10% of the community. Workshop one primarily looked at the opportunities and challenges that the community leaders saw from moving to 100% renewable. And by the way, I'm talking about stationary energy primarily. That's 10 minutes, Matt, just to let you know. Lovely. Thanks, Sam. Um, so these are the sorts of, this is the word map that came back on the opportunities. And the big one was they saw it as very much empowering our community, um, uh, showcasing what our community can do. Um, adding to the reliability for our energy, so improving on it, in other words. Uh, you know, a positive um, reflection on what it could do for marketing and our tourism-led economy, etc. cetera. Um, on the challenging challenges side, what they saw was similar, but the opposite, a lack of potential for a lack of community agreement on this. Um, the risk of making the reliability of power worse uh, or making the risk of bushfires worse, et cetera. And the reputational risk in, so that if we invested in something like a wave energy machine and then it turned out to be a white elephant and how that reflected on the community. And from there, we went to workshop two. And what we realized was there was quite a steep learning curve. And so, um, we came up with some infographics which spelt out a bit of at the background that we use 20 gigawatts of power a year and that only eight to ten percent of that came from renewables and then we went through different options and i'll go through pumped hydro as one example so we had an infographic on that explaining what it was about where the local best local sites were a um, bit of what their cost was and how long it takes to construct them and then the advantages and disadvantages and from there, we went to a summary comparing all the different uh, technology options, their costs, their advantages and disadvantages. And the important thing we got from the survey was that 90% of survey respondents said it was important that Apollo Bay is uh, powered by renewable energy. And so it validated what we as a group believed. And so it uh, gives us the um, strength to go to organisations and say, well, look, our community is solidly behind us. So the basic lessons from the roadmap were, one, build an unstoppable community movement, which we still need to do. We need to keep building on that. Um, two, we look, saw efficiency as providing roughly 40% of our target, rooftop solar 30 to 40%, and a turbine or a solar farm around about 30% too. And then to back that up with uh, a community battery and or a microgrid. Uh, and so we have to sell this vision to our community. So we needed a website. So we went to BZE again and they said, well, that's interesting. We're just looking at developing that for communities. Um, and so we worked with them and now they have a template which they different zero carbon communities can use. And why is that important? Um, it's because the problem is large, complex and intractable. It requires many partners like local government can't fix this on their own. Communities can't fix it on their own. Businesses can't fix it on their own. Even state government can't fix it on their own. We need to work collaboratively. And so we need to sell, as uh, Alex was saying before, we need to sell a vision and a map to get there. So. That's the community group's role in our, in our view, to inspire, to communicate and facilitate, to inform the, dom do, do, the dominant narrative, in other words, what is the goal that the community wants and how, what is the path to get there? And then to work within our sphere of influence, which we see as the community, because none of us are celebrities. That's where we have power within community and to affect change towards what we all want. And um, that's where we're at currently. So hopefully that's within the 15 minutes, Sam. Um, yeah, open for questions. Um, I had a question. Yep, go for it. Matt, um, I'm just curious, the community connectors uh, and getting those people together and, and finding those people in the community, 
How did you go about doing that? Uh, well, we're blessed with having only a small community. So, uh, like, I've lived here 30 years and so you just become embedded in the community and um, most of the people on our community group are heavily embedded already in the community. So it was a conversation around the table, Sam, that, you know, it was, oh, we should have, uh, we should have Sally from the bakery because she's always on social media and everybody knows her. Uh, we wanted a couple of councillors there. So we had three councillors attend out of seven in the Shire. They're very, very supportive. We had, we've already had some policy changes at council level as an outcome. Uh, so it was really a conversation that led, identified those people. The head of the Chamber of Commerce, for example, um, we wanted a local Sparky there, school deputy principal. Um, you know, the, the, those people are pretty obvious when you stop and think about it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, did anyone else have any questions? Um, um, I, had a, I had one, Matt. Um, yep. 50 uh, installations, that's amazing for um, a solar uh, drive in Alexa community. Um, I'm just wondering, what was the, the, how did you get so many people involved? Was it, were they driven by the environment? Was it the cost savings? What was the, what were you hearing from people? Okay, well, um, early on we were talking to Renew and they made it pretty clear that the three drivers for people putting solar panels on their roofs is um, one is the environment, not, not in any particular order. One is the hip pocket and the other one is to stick it to the man. In other words, sort of uh, just get some self-reliance and independence from big corporations. And so we sort of promoted it on that advice um, and we felt we got a good response on that. Um, the, it's complicated, but there were, we had a disaffected member who went off on his own. And just before we were about to launch our program, he launched the program, community program, as an individual. And um, that, I think he got about 30 installations as well. So, you know, the community really responded very strongly. And that, we felt there was a latent demand there just waiting to be fulfilled. And I looked at the part of the success was undoubtedly due to the state government and the wonderful rebates they, they released just prior. So but it's um, when you look at our curve, you can see the installations have flattened off and we think it's time to do another drive. Um, so we've been, um, we came to talk to Geelong Sustainability Group because I think they're settling on an installer soon, another uh, program. So we're wondering whether we could piggyback on that. Uh, we're, we're basically a core of six people working very hard. Uh, so, you know, we, we, none of us are experts. We are very much about partnering with organisations who can meet uh, the roles that we can't meet. And our role is to be the trusted advisor to the community. So in other words, the whole um, solar panel industry is so complex for individuals that they look to a, a voice, a trusted voice of advice. Thank I have you. a question. I, I have a question. Um, so in the second, the next solar drive, is there anything that you're going to be doing differently or you'll remain, keep it the same? What's your, what's your plan? I think we'll really be emphasising um, the feedback we got from the community via the roadmap process. So in other words, uh, we'll be using the launch of the community solar program to help start building this uh, vision well, it, if it's an embraced vision, effectively you've got community working as a team and that's when you're at your most powerful. As a group of six individuals, we're not particularly powerful. But as a, a Polar Bay community and an un, um, un, undoubtable voice for that community um, or unchallenged voice for that community, then we can be very powerful. So it's, it's I think politicians stand up and listen or sit up and listen when they know it's a whole community talking. If it's an individual or, or half a dozen, they'll give you less time. And it's the same with businesses. Numbers, numbers matter.
All right. Um, we've got some questions coming in. I might actually just put them on hold and maybe we'll go through Lisa's presentation and then we can answer. Oh, I can ask um, the panelists the questions if that's okay at the end. We'll turn it into a bit of a panel discussion. Um, if that's all right. Um, oh, sorry, I just did something there. All right. So um, thanks, Matt. That was a, a really great talk and I really like the, the emphasis that you have on collaboration and working together. Um, and that's, yeah, really important, I think, in this space. Uh, so our final speaker is Lisa Jarvis. Lisa is coordinator of the Dean's Marsh Community Cottage. Um, she's played an integral role in mobilising the Dean's Marsh community during the development of the Dean's Marsh and District Community Action Plan. The plan is um, incredible, it's visionary, um, and it's got um, environment and climate change as a clear priority and pillar throughout the plan, which I think uh, really signif signifies its importance to the Dean's Marsh community. Um, so take it away, Lisa, thank you. Thanks, Sam. And thanks, Alex and Matt, for your uh, discussions. Really informative. And Matt, I think you should move to Dean's Marsh, or at least come and talk to us next year anyway. So, look, I'm talking to you as, I guess, a, a community development person. That's my history and background. I'm not a scientist. I'm one of those people that gets overwhelmed by the amount of information that is out there and the amount of options. But anyway, I am really keen to share our little story of Dean's Marsh and what we did with the MADCAP process. Um, and hopefully you find some inspiration for what you can do in your communities um, or join with our community as well. Echoing uh, Matt's comments, you can't do it all and small communities can't do it on their own. We can do lots and we can advocate on, on our own behalf, but it's great to get all the different communities joining together while you're doing your own activities as well. So um, what's happening at the, the Shire level and also, well, international, as I'm hearing, um, all adds to that. But anyway, I'll stop yakking and share my screen. Okay. So the Dean's Marsh and District Community Action Plan is a 10-year plan. It really came about not because someone said we need to take action on climate change. It's, it was about a couple of strategies coming up that didn't resonate with our community and very much around land usage and land planning. But the thread that was um, there immediately was that people wanted to look at regenerative agriculture practices and challenge the notion that you needed large tracts of land um, to protect the environment and also to have viable farms. So what we did was look at, so I work for this little organisation called the Dean's Marsh Community Cottage. Um, we're funded through the Neighbourhood House Network. I would encourage everyone that has a, a neighbourhood house or a community house to really access that opportunity and that resource um, to make things happen. Traditionally, neighbourhood houses might have been uh, more in welfare zones, but we're very, very much on about community development and mobilising things. Many years ago, I met a fella called Peter Kenyon that runs a consultancy called the Bank of Ideas. Bank of Ideas works on an asset-based community development process, which I'll, I'll speak about. But 20 years ago, I met him and he inspired me so much that 20 years later, I said, I want you to come and work with our community had some initial discussions with Surf Coast Shire and they're really supportive with providing officer support to our project, but also some funding. And then through Vic Government Regional Development Victoria, we um, got $20,000 to undertake a community action plan process. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I really like is that we've got action in our heading. Um, you see a lot of community plans and their aspirational documents. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to, I guess, put wheels and put legs on things. Whilst the cottage can't be uh, political too much, <clears throat> I do encourage that, but I also encourage, I guess, strategic action that is going to link all the different partners together. Sorry, I'm just working out how I go. There we go. So the MADCAP process. 
As I said, between October and December, we ran a, a community consultation. It was really about identifying the assets, ideas and opinions of our community to come up with this action plan. So it was about having one, a, a great big conversation basically, um, which is something, while it sounds simple, that a lot of communities don't take the time to do regularly. So um, throughout the MADCAP process, we utilise the asset-based community development framework that again, I think, it, look, it seems really simple, but it's all in the vibe and it's all about having a chat. Matt talked about that his thing started around the kitchen table. So much is going to start with that. So in asset-based community development, positive change starts with having a chin wag, as we call it in the marsh. Have a conversation with people around things. Um, speak about what they're passionate about and what's important to them and what their priorities are. Quite often, even if it's something, someone that you would think you had nothing in common with, you will find something that you agree on passionately. Um, in my experience, and it's working in communities for a long time now, <clears throat> is that if you go to the negative, everyone gets downcast, nothing's gonna happen, okay? But when we focus on the resources, strengths, capacities, the can do, then people get energised, yeah? So it's really important to do that. Um, in every community, there's something that works. So often we, we uh, focus on what's wrong and how do we fix it? But let's look at what's working in our community and how do we get more of it? It generates energy and creativity. So in Dean's Marsh, one of our um, most inspiring things, I think, is the Otwayagra Forestry Network and our local land care. So how do we as a community support and build on those actions already? Again, as Matt talked about, existing organisations and linking in with what's happening. Um, another really crucial thing for communities and that asset-based community development looks at is local leadership and continuous development and renewal. Now, people will know if you're a lone wolf out there trying to change the world and do lots of work, you get tired, yeah? If you think about the, uh, the flock of geese going across the sky, you'll have the leader up the front and then the pilots will come up and lift those wings. So if you're working in, in community change, I'd really encourage you to, to form your team um, and to look at how you develop that. So for us here in Dean's Marsh, we did the community plan, but we also have a community builders program happening. I, in my role as, I guess, the, the coordinator of the cottage, look at myself as the networker. So again, in communities, really important to have someone that will pull people together um, and then probably sit quietly in the corner and allow the rest of it to happen. Um, this next point, the strength of the community, it's a big sentence, sorry, but basically it means that everyone's got something to offer and, and really, unless you're able to find ways that they can contribute their abilities and their assets, you're not gonna have a really strong community. So people can want to engage, but if the door's not open for them or they don't know how to, then you're not gonna capture their energy. So I think that's an important part. Um, Asset-based community development is a process and it's about highlighting your assets, mapping those assets, connecting. Dean's Marsh has got 269 people. I can make and we can make impact in our little area, but again, it's about joining up with others to be able to, to strengthen that. And harnessing the connected assets. So for example, I've got young people in this town that say, hey, we wanna have places for, that's that bloody border collie. We wanna have places for community supported agriculture, but I'm never, I'm a young person. I can't afford to buy land in Dean's Marsh. And then the old farmer up the road goes, I don't want to sell my farm, but gee, I'd really love to find out how I could uh, support young people in this community. And then you're looking at land banks and land leases and that kind of stuff. I think the other thing is how you present your info. Um, one of the benefits that we're already seeing from having the community action plan is that people can see what our community is on about. Funding bodies know what our priorities are. They know what our guiding values are and they know how to interact with us. So I think I feel that that puts our community in a position of more power than being passive recipients of government programs and being told um, what will happen to us. We want to make it happen ourselves. So um, <clears throat> now what I've... Oh, 
here we go, it's just coming up. So what we did, um, one of the ways, and it's gonna start, is the um, little madcap movie. So I'll let you enjoy this for a moment. Lisa, you've just um, muted the sound of the video. I'm not sure if you've done that on purpose or not. Last time I heard you, you were leaving us in the month of June. By that old wintry moon, a little grub from the scrub. Jackie Winter, nice and plump in your tongue for sweet. Catch a glimpse of a fat old tan, something new for your young kid. What's his game you play, Jackie Winter? Okay, so that I hope you enjoyed our little thing. And I have to just uh, make mention of the soundtrack. So local band <clears throat> Mountain Grey and Mike Robinson Cos runs Otway Greening, the nursery. And that song is about his observation on when the little Jackie Winterbird is arriving in the bushland. So, um, <clears throat> so basically that's what we found out of our process community guiding values, our vision, vision first guiding values, and then what our priorities were. <clears throat> and as you can see, whilst it didn't start out to be something about uh, specifically climate change, 
every part of climate change permeates every part of that plan. Yeah, if we're looking at community, if we're looking at local economy, so, you know, echoing uh, other speakers. So this is just another way that I think is interesting to look at presenting what you want to do. Um, so for us, we've got our vision, healthy, resilient and sustainable community in Dean's Marsh. Can I also add that I just ripped this picture off of work we did locally about eight years ago. So, you know, it can be a long process, but the time is nigh for some radical action. So let's make it happen. Um, but what we're looking at, foundational activities. So we look at information workshops. Often we're speaking to people that are already involved in a sphere. How do we get more people involved within that? Um, seasonal calendars, that's again about information for people. So we've got foundational activities because what you want to do is to get things happening in your community. Otherwise, people get a little bit overwhelmed with the bigness of it all and what do we do and how do we act. Um, influence activities, for me, I look at it, providing a market for local business is actually one of the most concrete things that we can do. So we're looking at doing our local markets demonstration sites of sustainability. Um, thank you, Matt, for the 25% the heads up on Dean's Marsh um, and, and with, you know, solar. Um, so it's looking at what have we already got and what have we done? And also a lot of target initiatives. Anyway, I want to leave enough time for questions at the end. So this last slide, this is um, our little grow free pantry. And so out of the madcap process, there was a lot of young people that wanted to start actions in the food security uh, forum. So um, once we were locked down, this little project started. It's got, so our population is 269. There's about a hundred local members in this little grow free pantry initiative. And it's amazing. So this is an example, I think, of a foundational activity that other things can grow from. And it's while we're still, because we've got the community plan, we can be advocating at a high strategic level. We can be linking in with other groups like Brace and, and those types of things. I think I'm back. I hope I didn't go unstable. Um, but just echoing both the other speakers that the time is now. Communities have the power to make change. We need partnerships to do that kind of stuff. But if our little community of 269 can attract funding and put something together like this, then I reckon you can in your communities. So I applaud you all for your work that you're already doing. Um, and I hope that our little case study um, provides some more inspiration and, and thoughts for you. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa, for uh, sharing that yeah, really incredible story of Dean's Mass community. Uh, did anyone have any questions? Uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, you can also raise your hand if you want to, and I can then allow you to talk um, or put it in the Q&A. Um, I, I had a question, Lisa. Um, I guess in terms of like community participation, were there any kind of like demographics, uh, as, yeah, people in the community that, uh, you found kind of hard to engage with um, and I guess how did you uh, did you have to put any like specific um, I don't know processes or, or like try and and reach them um, so that they could be involved in the process yeah look I think it's it's putting stuff right out there from the start so having a very open transparent process giving people information and opportunities and telling them um, about them again and again, because people miss information. I will have one comment though. Some people will never want to get engaged with it. Yeah, because their, their viewpoint is non-engagement. So as a community builder, you will have some people that are best left to, to do what they're doing. And what you'll find is that they'll come along in the process later when they see that there's outcomes or there's actions to it. So, um, so I, I think in that, so I think in terms of getting people engaged, it's telling everybody everything. It's being willing to take risks, jump off the cliff, get your wings on the way down and, and just do the best that, that you can with that stuff. I think the other thing is providing a whole range of ways for people to give information. So we did surveys. 
We did um, kitchen table conversations where people got $50 to get a picnic hamper and go and have a chat with their friends. So um, I guess it's providing a whole range of different ways that people are comfortable with. The other thing is if you know someone's not comfortable coming to a community forum, have a chat with them over their fence or, or, or have those informal discussions. Um, and I think the other thing is enlisting a, a really good team of people that then go and talk to other people. Not everyone is going to talk to me as an individual, but they'll talk to other people and, and all those connections happen. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, we've got a lot of uh, people who are saying that they were, yeah, really inspired uh, by you and Matt as well. Um, Matt asks uh, if COVID affected your process at all. Um, yes, it did. What it meant that was that we had to put off some of our community building workshops. So we um, developed the plan and then the next stage is about unpacking the plan. So we weren't able to do that in that way. But it also, COVID also was of great benefit to our process in that because people had been having conversations in, in the lead up to it, there was a lot of community resilience and a lot more community connection. And so that was demonstrated with things like the Grow Free Pantry, like com virtual community feasts, pen pal things. So, you know, things are always dub double-edged swords, aren't they? And, and I think the other interesting thing for our community was that we've learned we're pretty self-resilient and yeah, we can do well, yeah? So um, I am looking forward to now that we can gather again, starting after Christmas, where we were going to be 12 months ago. Um, so yeah, it looked definitely it had an impact, but there were some positive impacts. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, and we've just got a question from Francis, uh, who would like to hear more about regenerative agriculture and land share land trust arrangements. Yeah, so we've got, um, I, I guess we're early days in this space, but so what we want to do is to, to come up with a regenerative agriculture plan for here. We recognise that some farmers won't do total transition, but there's elements that they could do within their practices. Um, and I guess what we're finding, there's the Charles Massey and the Charlie Arnott fellow that when you see their farms compared to through drought compared to when you're not using regenerative agricultural practices as to when you are, that it's a lot better. The other thing I guess is that um, people have thought that having a hundred acres is what's required and that you're actually protecting environments. We've also got an argument that smaller land holdings actually increase the land care and the environmental care. So there's lots of threads in that that we're still exploring. Um, but what I'm really, I guess, heartened by is that we have young fam farmers that are fourth and fifth generation that are making these changes about to how we farm and what we do. So, again, um, watch this space. We'll make sure that, that our workshops and stuff are open to, to people shy wide um, and, and look at doing more farm tours, et cetera, with that. Thanks, Lisa. I might, uh, we've got a few questions which I think uh, all three of you could answer. So we might just turn it into a bit of a panel discussion if that's all right. So I'll just ask the question and um, yeah, I guess whoever wants to answer first, um, yeah, feel free to chime in um, and everyone else you can add to that. Um, so another question from Francis, uh, and I guess it'll be interesting because all three of you are kind of spread out in different areas, but uh, do you have any ideas to reduce transport emissions? I'm happy to have a go at that. Thank so you. I think, I think um, what's pretty obvious is um, part of the answer will be electric vehicles. And um, we're conscious that Apollo Bay could be um, an excellent recharging site on the Great Ocean Road, given that there's not many charging sites on the Great Ocean Road. So I, I don't know if the Surf Coast Shire has a charging site. Um, we do have one small old one in Lawn, um, but it's uh, definitely room for improvement in that space. And it, I will just add that it's 28% of our emissions as a Shire, roughly. If, if um, that's the work coming out of our community emissions profile. So it's a huge chunk. 
Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's a pretty obvious part of it. So we need to, when, when our roadmap says we use 20 gigawatts of power a year, if you included um, transport, electric transport, then it's probably double that, you know, or, or one and a half times that. So we need to, if we're serious about reducing emissions to zero, then we need to look at um, generating much more than 20 gigawatts of renewable energy. And, Thanks. Oh, and, sorry. And, and Rose's just picked me up. Yep, the RACV does have really fast chargers and four of them. Sorry, I was talking from a council perspective. And also, you can fill up your electric vehicle at one of the pubs in Winchelsea for a small fee. They run an electric cord out for you. So, that's, that's hmm. <laughs> so I think what we've got is we've got a few charges for the, uh, the first uptakers of uh, electric vehicles, but we really haven't got enough charges to fast charges to really meet a big transition. Like I've got a sister in Norway, and 50%, more than 50% of all new car sales are electric cars. And I've read reports that within six years, all new cars will sold will be electric vehicles. So we need to gear up for that, I think. It's a bit like a Berlin Wall moment. You know, it will reach a point where it's a no-brainer to buy an electric car versus a petrol car. And the state government has just announced in their recent budget um, a bit of money to go to electric charges. So it'd be great. Um, like we'll be looking at the council, how we can work with community groups and our community to try and secure our share of that, that funding. Mm. Uh, Alex or Lisa, did you want to add to that at all? Yeah, sure. Um, increased public transport usage and then more accessible public transport, especially for people further down the surf coast towards, you know, um, lawn and it's pretty much impossible to for it to be practical to use public transport so and um, yeah that's a complicated issue if we you know we have to have people using it and if, but if we don't have accessible public transport people aren't going to use it so it's a bit of a loop but yeah public transport's important mm. yeah and I guess um from my perspective it's around community transport options like for us being a, a small isolated community um, is looking at people's behaviours, so encouraging people to ride share, encouraging people to pick up stuff for one another, all that really grassroots stuff, um, as well as, yes, the critical mass for enough electric car sales and affordable electric cars. Mm. But I think, you know, it's, a lot of it is the behaviour change for people and to, rather than jump in the car, um, yeah, think about it. I think there's a role for community groups here too. I know Hepburn Wind have got a um, they've got a program at the moment where their members can buy a second-hand electric car that's imported from Japan and checked out in and is in completely good condition. So there are more and more affordable ways to enter that market. Um, so you know, I think yeah, it's we're on the verge of major change. Thanks, Matt. Um, so the next question uh, is from Councillor Rose Hodge. Uh, and please correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, Rose, but um, I think it was when Alex was talking about the climate emergency. Um, so why do you think some people uh, still don't think there's a need for a climate emergency, um, and especially in the different tiers of government? That's a good question. Um, there's many reasons. One of the reasons is that often when we're talking about climate and the, uh, the climate emergency, it's all negative. It's all talking about how serious and severe and scary it is. And because of that, and especially when we're talking mainstream, when we're talking about community discussions and one-on-one -on -one discussions, it's less so, but a lot of people hear about this big thing called climate change and it's so terrifying and there's there doesn't seem to be any solutions to it so we just shut it off and ignore it and when we hear people talking about wanting to declare climate emergency we say oh that's ridiculous don't that's so dramatic or it's it's not necessary or it's politicizing um local governments or it's yeah it's 
it's not necessary or virtue signaling because it's terrifying to actually to face it that's one of the reasons another reason is probably uh i get uh, that sort of thinking that it's just virtue signaling think, thinking that um and sometimes occasionally it is there have been there's 1800 across the world uh, jurisdictions but um it has to be followed up with action that's a really important part of it and that's that's part of uh, the community's job to really push for action and mobilization after that mm. declaration point not just declare and wipe your hands and move on so there are yeah that's that's some of the reasons but i i clearly as i as i was speaking about earlier today have a passion and i think it's necessary and good and hopeful mm. yeah thanks thanks, <laughs> thanks for sharing that alex um yeah i guess at, at south coast shy council um yeah we definitely uh yeah, I really want to put action towards our climate emergency. So it's not just like a symbolic um, declaration, but that we're actually, um, yeah, contributing and um, getting a really impactful climate emergency response. Uh, Matt or Lisa, did you guys want to add to that at all? Yeah, happy to um, oh, I think... go, Lisa. No, go, Matt. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Uh, so I've got two thoughts here. I think there are two key things that define the human species as different from other species. One is that we seem to be very good at dealing with uh, immediate emergencies like a world war declared or something like that and terrible at dealing with emergencies that are slowly uh, transpiring and down the track some way. That's one key difference. And the other key difference is that what defines us as very different from all the other primates, oh, sorry, the all hominoids, as I understand it, is that um, we have the ability to agree on a abstract and shared narrative and act as a very large team of people towards the one solution. Uh, and so we have the power to act as large communities towards a common goal. And so that Climate emergency declaration to me is about changing the um, dominant narrative about climate change. It's not something we can get around to when it's economically feasible. It's a bloody emergency and if we don't do something immediately, we're all in serious shit. That's the reality. But, you know, vested interests have us uh, believing a different narrative. So I applaud the uh, climate declaration movement. I applaud the AMA for declaring a climate emergency, the profession of architects that have declared a climate emergency, the Australian profession of engineers that have declared, you know, it's, it's, it's bloody obvious to everybody, um, except the ones that are informed by certain vested interests, I think. Sorry, had my rant. Your turn, Lisa. Oh, I don't think I could have said it more eloquently, actually. <laughs> Have a go. But, but I think, of course, it's around vested interest. But, you know, as COVID has shown us, well, COVID's shown us if you're in a position of, of privilege living out in the bush, as I do, that our lifestyle can actually be better, you know. Mm -hmm. So the things, the lifestyle that we've pursued that's got us in this whatever, as Matt would say, um, isn't necessarily a lifestyle that is good and healthy for us. So I think part of it is also people going actually the lifestyle that we've been fed and what's been um, touted as being what is success to us, um, I think that's on the way out. I think the capitalist system is on the way out um, and, and good riddance to it. But I think it's also the messaging to go, you're not actually losing anything through this, you're actually gaining. And what you're going to gain is a better planet and a better society um, and hope for the future and security for the future. Um, Matt, you know, when we started chatting tonight, it was it's around the children and the ne next generations. Yeah. You know, we get a bit long in the tooth and we go, we've had an all right life. But by golly, there's some amazing things yet to happen on this planet. And um, it's very, yeah. very heartening to be part of these conversations because we can do it. You know, Alex, our, um, you know, that she shows us that we can do it with good leadership. Mm. 
Um, so, you know, I spent my time protesting against uranium and throwing toilet rolls at Hawkey and doing all that kind of stuff. There's definitely a place for it. But there's also um, a place for really smart strategic action and political action. Um, yeah, you know, all that stuff, guys. Let's do it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much, Lisa. We've got a question from um, Alan that came in earlier around, I think it was when Matt was talking around, is anything like this happening in the surf coast currently? So um, there is two, two, two parts to Matt's, I guess, was one, one was the solar bulk buy side of his discussion. And um, the Geelong Sustainability and Surf Coast Energy Group have been looking at, um, at doing things in this space with the community. Often we find with those bulk buy things, um, it's best for council to get out of the way. Um, and let the community run the bulk buys. We can um, help by assisting it with promotion and things like that. But um, really the, when they're community led, they seem to run better. Um, and in terms of the other side of Matt's discussions around the community planning, that's what we're really hoping to get um, stuck into in the first half of next year when we start our, uh, our climate emergency community um, responses. So we're hoping to um, draw on the great stuff that like Dean's Marsh has um, done and take that to the rest of the communities across the, the surf coast and um, see what ideas people have and yeah, w where we should be focusing our efforts as a community, I guess. Um, so uh, Sam, uh, is there other another question or is there anything you want to add yeah. on that? Uh, yeah, so we might just uh, end on uh, Councillor Galzard has, has a few questions. So I might just choose one of them. Um, and then we'll, uh, yeah, just finish on that question. So uh, are there any suggestions on how we can reduce fossil fuels and lobby federal government when they are still planning a gas-led recovery? In brackets, so frustrating. And yes, I very much agree with you, Kate. Um, we, we did see this week that the state government got to uh, announced we got to our 25% renewable energy generation target as a state, which is good, but it still shows, I guess, there's a long way to go. Um, and um, from a council point of view, I'll just say that we are part of a group called Climate Emergency Australia that we've uh, joined up to as one of the founding members with a number of other councils that have declared climate emergencies. And we are we do do some advocacy through that. Um, yeah, and that is include like writing letters in support of um, net zero 2050 targets and things like that. So there's lots of work we can do in that space, I think, um, coming forward, going forward. But uh, if anyone, I'm sure there's some, I'm sure Alex or Lisa or Matt have some great ideas about advocacy. Go, oh, Alex or well, Lisa. Yeah, um, uh, I suppose activism mostly is the one of the biggest things um and just uh, making getting that getting your voice out doing things like signing petitions attending protests and making sure that uh, like getting heard about that we don't want fossil fuels anymore we want to phase out and we don't want a gas led recovery uh, yeah <laughs> well actually one one interesting thing that's happened in Surf Coast has been a new development in Torquay that's um, got no gas in it, run, and it's been developed by Bar and Water, the Salter State in Torquay. It's really interesting to see, um, cool. see what happens there. That's really cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you, you, you can do uh, you can do the, uh, new developments without gas, I guess now. Mm. Um, I, I don't know, Lisa, if you've got anything to say on that, but I, I think it's a real challenge. Gas is being promoted as a um, a recovery from COVID to generate jobs. Mm. So I think if you attack it on that basis, and so BZE have their million jobs plan based around renewables, retrofitting for efficiency, uh, new solar gen installations, wind installations, etc. The Climate Institute has a plan around more jobs through renewables. So I think embracing those sorts of um, those plans as a better option for jobs is probably as good a way as any, but I don't know the answer to that. It's a tough one. Lisa, did you want to share anything or? Oh no, I was about to have a little sing because I thought Sean might think there was an awkward little uh, space <laughs> happening there. <laughs> so I guess, you know, it, it is really about 
rejecting those. Again, it's what, you know, if there's no consumer demand for stuff, then people can't um, make money out of it. But there's got to be good alternatives. So I guess, you know, echoing Matt's thing, it's going, okay, that's that. But, you know, renewables are going to be worth a whole lot more jobs and, and just shutting that narrative down. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much for um, yeah your insight and, and response to those questions and also your presentation. Um, I just wanted to see if um, Councillor Rose Hodge or Councillor um, Kate Gazard wanted to uh, share anything quickly or reflect um, on this evening. If you do, feel free just to put it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, it's a bit tricky here, but I can allow you to talk if you want. Um, yep, Councillor Hodge, I think you can talk now. Yeah, it's great that yes. someone can let me talk. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, what, what's really, really important coming up, and I'm sure Kate will agree with me, um, we'll be doing a council plan early next year. And it's really, really important that we get as much um, of what you've spoken about tonight in that council uh, plan because that's our blueprint for the next four years and that sort of guides our budget. So, um, you know, uh, Dean Smarsh has done a fantastic job. Bad luck, Apollo Bay, you're, you're not in Surf Coast. But I know Alex will be pushing us very strongly, but I really want young people and anyone that's really interested in this is to be really um, in our council plan, in all the community engagement to make sure that we capture your thoughts. And Dean Smarsh has just done a great job and hopefully we can capture that right across the Shire that can guide us in the next four years and beyond. Thank you, Sam, for doing such a great MC job as well and Sean behind the scenes as well. No worries, thank you, Councillor Hodge. Um, yeah, very important point about the council plan there. Um, and Councillor Gazard, I'll allow you to talk. I think you can talk now. Yeah, does that work? Yep. Oh, great. Um, thanks so much, Sam, and thanks um, to all the presenters. This has been a really great session um, and very, very great education and motivation in the area. Um, this is something that's really important to me, um, as I think a lot of people know from during the campaign, but I, this beautiful coastline, I think we all want to protect and there's so many people who are so, um, I guess, invested in climate action and I really hope that we can lead the way in this. And so I'm very keen to hear from anyone. Um, I can put my email address in the chat, but if there's, I think it would be great if we can all collaborate and kind of um, use, you know, not have to reinvent the wheel, but any um, methods to reduce carbon emissions throughout Victoria, we should share them all and... Um, and work together. But this has been really great. I always love hearing from other like-minded people. It's really inspiring. So thanks to everyone tonight. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Councillor Gazard. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to say again, I guess echoing everyone's thank yous. Um, thank you to the three panellists, um, uh, Matt, Lisa and Alex, really appreciate you guys joining us tonight uh, and so close before Christmas as well. Um, and also thank you to everyone else who tuned in. Um, really appreciate uh, yeah, you spending the evening with us. Um, and I hope you've learned a lot um, and taken away a lot from our three panelists and also the discussions that we've had. Um, yeah, I know I've learned a lot um, and yeah, very keen to move forward. Um, and yeah, hopefully turn some, some of this talk into, into action. Um, so for those who are interested, I've, I've put uh, a few links in the chat. Um, so the, one of the links is to our climate change survey, which would be awesome for as many people as possible to complete that and share with your networks. Um, as Sean said, we've got some upcoming opportunities. Um, we'll be working with the community on climate emergency discussions and actions and what a community climate emergency response might look like. So there's also a link to that. Um, and this event was part of our Reimagine Surf Coast workshop and event series. Um, and we've got some really good local food focus workshops lined up for uh, February onwards. And we're also looking at holding another climate change focused 
event um, in around the end of January. So um, there's a link to kind of stay up to, up to date with those different workshops and events there. Um, otherwise, I'd like to say, uh, yeah, thanks again. Uh, have a great night and I hope you'll have a safe and enjoyable festive season. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everybody. See ya. Cheers. Bye.